SIGINT is a contraction of signals intelligence. Before the development of radar and other electronics techniques, signals intelligence and communications intelligence were essentially synonymous. Sir Francis Walsingham ran a postal interception bureau with some cryptanalytic capability during the reign of Elizabeth I, but the technology was only slightly less advanced than men with shotguns during World War I, who jammed pigeon post communications and intercepted the messages carried. Flag signals were sometimes intercepted, and efforts to impede them made the occupation of the signaler one of the most dangerous on the battlefield. The middle 19th century rise of the telegraph allowed more scope for interception and spoofing of signals, as shown at Chancellorsville. Signals intelligence became far more central to military intelligence generally with the mechanization of armies, development of blitzkrieg tactics. Use of submarine and commerce raiders warfare, and the development of practicable radio communications. Even measurement and signature intelligence preceded electronic intelligence, with sound ranging techniques for artillery location. SIGINT is the analysis of intentional signals for both communications and non communications systems while MASINT is the analysis of unintentional information, including, but not limited to, the electromagnetic signals that are the main interest in SIGINT. Origins Electronic interception appeared as early as 1900, during the Boer Wars. The Royal Navy had installed wireless sets produced by Marconi on board their ships in the late 1890s and some limited wireless signalling was used by the British Army. Some wireless sets were captured by the Boers and were used to make vital transmissions. Since the British were the only people transmitting at the time, no special interpretation of the signals was necessary. The Imperial Russian Navy also experimented with wireless communications under the guidance of Alexander Popov, who first installed a wireless set on a grounded battleship in 1900. The birth of signals intelligence in a modern sense dates to the Russo-Japanese War, as the Russian fleet prepared for conflict with Japan in 1904. The British ship HMS Diana stationed in the Suez Canal was able to intercept Russian naval wireless signals being sent out for the mobilization of the fleet. For the first time in history, an intelligence report on signals intercepted by HMS Diana at Suez shows that the rate of working was extremely slow by British standards. While the Royal Navy interpreters were particularly critical of the poor standard of grammar and spelling among the Russian operators, the Japanese also developed a wireless interception capability and succeeded in listening into the then primitive Russian communications. Their successes emphasized the importance of this new source of military intelligence, and facilities for the exploitation of this information resource were established by all the major powers in the following years. The Austro-Hungarian Evidence Bureau was able to comprehensively monitor the progress of the Italian army during the Italo-Turkish War of 1911 by monitoring the signals that were sent by a series of relay stations from Tripoli to Rome. In France, Dexima Bureau of the Military General Staff was tasked with radio interception. World War I. It was over the course of the war that the new method of intelligence collection, signals intelligence, reached maturity. The British in particular built up great expertise in the newly emerging field of signals intelligence and code breaking. Failure to properly protect its communications fatally compromised the Russian army in its advance early in World War I and led to their disastrous defeat by the Germans under Ludendorff and Hindenburg at the Battle of Tannenberg. France had significant signals intelligence in World War I. Commandant Cartier developed a system of wireless masts, including one on the Eiffel Tower to intercept German communications. 
The first such station was built as early as 1908, although was destroyed by flooding a few years afterward. In the early stages of the war, French intercepts were invaluable for military planning and provided the crucial intelligence to Commander-in-Chief Joseph Joffre that enabled him to carry out the successful counter-attack against the Germans at the Marne in September 1914. In 1918, French intercept personnel captured a message written in the new ADF GVX cipher, which was cryptanalyzed by Georges Painvin. This gave the Allies advance warning of the German 1918 spring offensive. U.S. communications monitoring of naval signals started in 1918, but was used first as an aid to naval and merchant navigation. In October 1918, just before the end of the war, the U.S. Navy installed its first DF installation at its station at Bar Harbor, Maine soon joined by five other Atlantic coast stations and then a second group of 14 installations. These stations, after the end of World War I, were not used immediately for intelligence. While there were 52 Navy medium-wave DF stations in 1924, most of them had deteriorated cracking the German naval codes by the start of the First World War. A worldwide commercial undersea communication cable network had been built up over the previous half-century, allowing nations to transmit information and instructions around the world. Techniques for intercepting these messages through ground returns were developed. So all cables running through hostile territory could in theory be intercepted. On the declaration of war, one of Britain's first acts was to cut all German undersea cables. On the night of 3 August 1914, the cable ship Alert located and cut Germany's five transatlantic cables, which ran down the English Channel. Soon after, the six cables running between Britain and Germany were cut. This forced the Germans to use either a telegraph line that connected through the British network and could be tapped or through radio which the British could then intercept. The destruction of more secure wired communications, to improve the intelligence take, has been a regular practice since then. While one side may be able to jam the other's radio communications, the intelligence value of poorly secured radio may be so high that there is a deliberate decision not to interfere with enemy transmissions. Although Britain could now intercept German communications, codes and ciphers were used to hide the meaning of the messages. Neither Britain nor Germany had any established organizations to decode and interpret the messages at the start of the war. The Royal Navy had only one wireless station for intercepting messages. At Stockton, disambiguation needed. However, installations belonging to the post office and the Marconi Company, as well as private individuals who had access to radio equipment, began recording messages from Germany. Realizing that the strange signals they were receiving were German naval communications, they brought them to the Admiralty. Rear Admiral Henry Oliver appointed Sir Alfred Ewing to establish an interception and decryption service. Among its early recruits were Alistair Deniston, Frank Hadcock, John Beasley, Francis Birch, Walter Horace Bruford, William Nobby Clark, Frank Cyril T. Arx and Dilly Knox. In early November 1914 Captain William Hall was appointed as the new director of the Intelligence Division to replace Oliver. A similar organization had begun in the Military Intelligence Department of the War Office which became known as ME-1B, and Colonel McDonough proposed that the two organizations should work together. Little success was achieved except to organize a system for collecting and filing messages until the French obtained copies of German military ciphers. The two organizations operated in parallel, decoding messages concerning the Western Front. A friend of Ewing's, a barrister by the name of Russell Clark, plus a friend of his, Colonel Hippersley, approached Ewing to explain that they had been intercepting German messages. Ewing arranged for them to operate from the Coast Guard station at Hunstanton in Norfolk. They formed the core of the interception service known as Y-Service, together with the post office and Marconi stations. 
which grew rapidly to the point it could intercept almost all official German messages. In a stroke of luck, the SKM codebook was obtained from the German light cruiser Magdeburg, which ran aground on the island of Odense home off the coast of Russian-controlled Estonia. The books were formally handed over to the First Lord, Winston Churchill, on 13 October. The SKM by itself was incomplete as a means of decoding messages since they were normally enciphered as well as coded, and those that could be understood were mostly weather reports. An entry into solving the problem was found from a series of messages transmitted from the German Nordic transmitter, which were all numbered sequentially and then re-enciphered. The cipher was broken, in fact broken twice as it was changed a few days after it was first solved, and a general procedure for interpreting the messages determined. A second important code, the Handelwerk Erzbuch codebook used by the German Navy, was captured at the very start of the war from the German-Australian steamer Hobart. Seized off Port Phillip Heads near Melbourne on the 11th of August 1914. The code was used particularly by light forces such as patrol boats and for routine matters such as leaving and entering harbour. The code was used by U-boats, but with a more complex key. A third code book was recovered following the sinking of German destroyer SMS S-119 in a battle off Texel Island. Its greatest importance during the war was that it allowed access to communications between naval attaches in Berlin, Madrid, Washington, Buenos Aires, Peking, and Constantinople. The German fleet was in the habit each day of wirelessing the exact position of each ship and giving regular position reports when at sea. It was possible to build up a precise picture of the normal operation of the high seas fleet. Indeed to infer from the routes they chose where defensive minefields had been placed and where it was safe for ships to operate. Whenever a change to the normal pattern was seen, it immediately signaled that some operation was about to take place and a warning could be given. Detailed information about submarine movements was also available. Direction finding the use of radio receiving equipment to pinpoint the location of the transmitter was also developed during the war. Captain H.J. Round working for Marconi, began carrying out experiments with direction finding radio equipment for the army in France in 1915. Hall instructed him to build a direction finding system for the Navy. This was sited at Lowestoft and other stations were built at Lerwick, Aberdeen, York, Flamborough Head and Birchington and by May 1915 the Admiralty was able to track German submarines crossing the North Sea. Some of these stations also acted as Y stations to collect German messages. But a new section was created within Room 40 to plot the positions of ships from the directional reports. Room 40 had very accurate information on the positions of German ships. But the Admiralty priority remained to keep the existence of this knowledge secret. From June 1915 the regular intelligence reports of ship positions ceased to be passed to all flag officers, but only to Admiral Jellicoe himself. Similarly, he was the only person to receive accurate charts of German minefields prepared from Room 40 information. No attempts were made by the German fleet to restrict its use of wireless until 1917, and then only in response to perceived British use of direction finding, not because it believed messages were being decoded. It became increasingly clear that as important as the decrypts were, it was of equal importance to accurately analyze the information provided. An illustration of this was provided by someone at the Admiralty who knew a little too much detail about SIGINT without fully understanding it. He asked the analysts where call sign DK was located, which was that used by the German commander when in harbor. The analyst answered his question precisely, telling him that it was in the Jade River. Unfortunately the High Seas Fleet commander used a different identifier when at sea, going so far as to transfer the same wireless operator ashore so the messages from the harbour would sound the same. 
The misinformation was passed to Jellicoe commanding the British fleet, who acted accordingly and proceeded at a slower speed to preserve fuel. The Battle of Jutland was eventually fought but its lateness in the day allowed the enemy to escape. Jellicoe's faith in cryptographic intelligence was also shaken by a decrypted report that placed the German cruiser SMS Regensburg near him. During the Battle of Jutland, it turned out that the navigator on the Ravensburg was off by 10 miles in his position calculation. During Jutland, there was limited use of direction finding on fleet vessels, but most information came from shore stations. A whole string of messages were intercepted during the night indicating with higher reliability how the German fleet intended to make good its escape, but the brief summary which was passed to Jellicoe failed to convince him of its accuracy in light of the other failures during the day. Zimmermann Telegram and other successes Room 40 played an important role in several naval engagements during the war, notably in detecting major German sorties into the North Sea. The Battle of Dogger Bank was won in no small part due to the intercepts that allowed the Navy to position its ships in the right place. Warned of a new German raid on England on the night of 23-24 January by radio intercepts, Admiral Sir David Beatty's force made a rendezvous off the Dogger Bank. The outnumbered Germans turned in flight. The Kaiser, fearful of losing capital ships, ordered his navy to avoid all further risks. It played a vital role in subsequent naval clashes, including at the Battle of Jutland as the British fleet was sent out to intercept them. The direction-finding capability allowed for the tracking and location of German ships, submarines and zeppelins. Intercepts were also able to prove beyond doubt that the German high command had authorized the sinking of the Lusitania in May 1915. Despite the vociferous German denials at the time, the system was so successful that by the end of the war over 80 million words, comprising the totality of German wireless transmission over the course of the war had been intercepted by the operators of the Y stations and decrypted. However its most astonishing success was in decrypting the Zimmermann telegram, a telegram from the German Foreign Office sent via Washington to its ambassador Heinrich von Eckhard in Mexico. In the telegram's plain text, Nigel de Grey and William Montgomery learned of the German Foreign Minister Arthur Zimmermann's offer to Mexico of United States's territories of Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas as an enticement to join the war as a German ally. The telegram was passed to the U.S. by Captain Hall, and a scheme was devised to conceal how its plain text had become available and also how the U.S. had gained possession of a copy. The telegram was made public by the United States, which declared war on Germany on 6 April 1917, entering the war on the Allied side.